see that? I'll go to full screen. Mm -hmm. There we are. It, it, so can everybody see that? Yep. 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 You can hear me okay? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, as Ian said, this is the, the first one we've tried. Um, so, you know, when Ian suggested this, I started going through all the photos I've taken over the last 10 years here. And um, so I came up with about five hours worth of presents. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so you're going to be here for a while. while. <laughs> Anyhow, so I, I pared it down quite hard. And uh, I really don't have any idea how long this is going to take. So if it does take too long, I'll skip some of the, the, the um, subcategories. Uh, you know, we don't know how long the discussion will take or, or what. So I pared it down to the to to this is the outline here. Well, to have a brief introduction about uh, me and how I got introduced to the river, a little bit about the river, and then just completely unconnected, we'll talk a little bit about some of the fish in the river, some slime molds, uh, a few bugs, some formations of water, and then we'll end up with a couple of uh, with two birds. And, uh, <laughs> So anyhow, so uh, so I moved to Coquitlam in 2009, which is uh, you know 12 years ago, which is hard to believe. And uh, so the house that I bought is right here. It's on Gabriella Drive, this little red circle. So just to get the uh, perspective, this is Pipeline Road, David Avenue, Shaughnessy, and this blue line here is the Coquitlam River. The track. This is the Trans Canada Trail along here, and. It's 160 steps from my front door to the river. Wow. And if you stand at the nice. top, yeah, it's just fantastic. You know, it, it's less than a minute. So if you stand right where the air, the arrow is and look southwest, that's that's my house. That was taken this morning about 10 o'clock. If you turn around and face east, where that uh, squiggly yellow line is, is the river. And if you walk down there, that's the view of the river there. Uh, wow. The <laughs> Nice. Yeah, so that, that was 11 o'clock this morning. The um, pipes you see in the foreground are, are part of a huge storm drain, which drains most of Westwood Plateau. And this whole area has deep problems, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. If you walk 100 feet to the left, you come to this beach here. And uh, this is where I spend most of my time when I go down to the river. Uh, it, I call it the Cooper Beach because the property that it's on used to belong to a woman named Molly Cooper, who uh, lived in a house in the property till about 2010, at which point I think she was about 99 years old. And uh, quite a remarkable individual. Um, so in the fall of 2009, uh, Susan and I went to the Rivers and Trails Festival in Poco. And we met Ian. And at that point, I joined the uh, Ian's group, River Watch, which involved, and so what that meant was that I committed to once a month walking a stretch of the river from David Avenue here on the west side down to the Patricia footbridge and just recording what I saw, things like the river level, water quality, um, the number of people using the river, walkers, joggers, cyclists, dogs on and off leash, um, <laughs> birds, fish, anything. And Ian would, uh, th there were 18 reaches on the river and Ian would con uh, collate the results and produce a newsletter. So that's what got me started going down to the river and, and recording things. And as time went on, I started going down every two weeks. I wouldn't walk the whole stretch. I'd just go down and then it became every week. And now I'm at the point where I go down every day down to, uh, down to the beach, which is right here. And Sometimes I'll be down there for 10 minutes and sometimes it'll be three or four hours, depending on what's going on. It, it drives Susan nuts because <laughs> she never knows how long I'm going to be. Uh, so, you know, every morning I get up, I have my bowl of shreddies and I walk down to the river. And uh, so I think of it, you know, a lot of people get up and they have their cup of coffee in the morning. I think of this as my cup of coffee. I go down to the river instead of having a cup of coffee. So uh, this is a Google Maps picture showing the uh, course of the Coquitlam River from the dam up here down to the mouth of the Fraser, which is right here. And the river 
it's about, if you waded the river from the mouth to the dam, it's about 17 kilometers. And the, the river changes character, character dramatically as it lead, uh, travels from the dam down to the mouth. In the upper reaches, uh, the river is, the valley is narrow, the river is steep, the water is fast, there's a lot, the bottom is mostly boulders, the river is very turbulent. In the middle stretch, sort of Galette, this is around the Galette area, the river, the gradient eases, the river becomes wider, uh, you still have a boulder bottom. This is looking north from the Patricia footbridge, the river is wide, fairly smooth, but it still has a bit of a drop. And then you get down to Colony Farm, and this is the view looking north from Colony Farm. And from about the Red Bridge down to the mouth, the river is basically flat. The bottom is silty, the river is slow. It would meander if it weren't diked. And then it reaches the, uh, the Fraser. So this is the, the Coquitlam here, and this is the Fraser. This was taken on a winter day when shortly after uh, everything had frozen. And this is a view of the mouth from uh, the Portman Bridge. So here's the here's the, uh, the mouth of the river, and this is the Fraser here. So the river changes character dramatically as it moves from the dam down to the mouth. It also changes character over the years. Um, the river level rises and falls. This is a photo of a little island, uh, which is about five minutes from my place, and this was taken in May. And so if you focus your attention on this little stretch of water here, just to get a feeling for how the river changes over the year. This is in the, in the winter, six months later. This is in the summer. And you can see that you could, you could walk to the island without getting wet. And then in, in the fall, after a high water event, you'd be your life in your hands if you tried to cross to the, <laughs> cross to the river. So this is a composite just to give you some feeling for, um, for just how how much the river changes in level and, and character during the year. So I, I, I just find it absolutely fascinating just to, to follow this kind of progress, this evolution throughout the year. When the river is quite high, the water has a, is very powerful. And it can, this is a tree, this cottonwood here fell and was pushed against the standing tree and the river was strong enough to actually snap the the, the trunk. And now uh, th this is uh, something that I find kind of fascinating. This was just uh, upstream from the Patricia Bridge. This log had become wedged between this tree here and this tree right at the river edge with the end of the log in, in the river. And so as the river rose and fell, the log would rub against the trees. <laughs> but over time, it eroded the uh, the log here. Oh, yeah. Wow. And so, I mean, you know, that's phenomenal. It's, uh, I, I have no idea how long the log was there, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's done something there. Great photos, Jeff. Wow. Excellent. Sorting. Okay. So first, uh, first change of subject. So now we'll talk about fish. Um, this is a view looking up from the Millennium Bridge. This was taken about three weeks ago, actually. You can see Mount Coquitlam up here and freshly covered in snow. So when the river, uh, when we have a high water event, uh, the river rises very quickly and then it drops very quickly and it will often strand, leave fish stranded on the, on the shore. And this guy, this is the sculpin. And uh, so I was walking along one evening and he, there he was. So I thought he was dead. So I thought, well, I'll take some photos and hence the dime. So I reached down to pick him up to pose him for some shots, and he actually shot out of my hands and into the river. And <laughs> now I, I don't know how long he'd been there, but it had to be at least an hour. And for some reason or other, he managed to survive. And so that's something that I'd really be interested to know is what allowed this fish to survive that length of time out of water, because you tend to think of fishes as, uh, as dying very quickly once they're out of the water. Uh, certainly salmon fry die quite quickly. This is a little guy who got stranded. And then this beetle came along and was uh, nibbling away at it. And it actually managed to move it about, in the time that I watched it, it moved it about an inch uh, along. I don't know where it was taking it, but. And then the river often, for, uh, when it drops, it will leave pools and the fry will happily exist in the pools as long as the pools don't dry out. 
So this is a pool that's about two inches deep and it froze over and the fry, fry were happily swimming around underneath it in probably about an inch, an inch and a half of water. Quite, uh, quite happy. Here's a couple of chum spawning off. Uh, I, I should explain that the, the beach I mentioned, Cooper Beach, that we saw at the beginning, I consider my beach. So I will call it my beach. <laughs> Everybody will just take that with a grain of salt, but I'll call it. <laughs> uh, so these are some, some chum spawning. This would be in October. Um, but there's other kinds of salmon. There's concrete salmon. <laughs> this is down at Bedford and Chine um, by Maple Creek. There's metal salmon, which are under the uh, <laughs> Kingsway Bridge. And Coquitlam spent thousands of dollars building this salmon uh, at Spirit Square opposite the City Hall. But, uh, going back to real salmon. Uh, these are, the top one is a, a male Chinook and the bottom one is a, a male pink or humpback. And uh, you can really see the, the hump that the, uh, the pink develops when it, uh, when it comes into fresh water. Uh, by the way, if I say anything incorrect, please dive in and correct me because it's, uh, I will probably make some statements that aren't right. So please correct me. Uh, and this is the male coho. And these are chum. So uh, in a good chum year, the, the river banks will be absolutely covered with, the, with these guys. And they often get caught in the shrubs when the river drought levels drop. <laughs> oh. And uh, it's not infrequent that you come across salmon eggs. So these ones came from a female who hadn't spawned and some creature had had eaten her and uh, and just left the um, left the eggs there. The uh, salmon are an essential part of the, the food chain along the river. They provide nutrients for all kinds of creatures. This little guy was a uh, well, big guy actually. I uh, was down at my beach, uh, happily chewing on this carcass. So I, I watched him for about five or 10 minutes from a respectful distance. And then this cr a crow came in and chased him off. And this is what was left of the carcass when the crow chased him off. But about five minutes later, he came back. And uh, after another 20 minutes, there was very little left of the, uh, of the carcass. And this is a shot I showed at uh, the January meeting, but it's... <laughs> so I, I was going to put a thought balloon on this thing, you know, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, I, I have no idea what, what the uh, result of this was. I, um, I watched him for about 10 or 15 minutes and he just sort of sat there and uh, or stood and uh, so I, I had to leave and when I came back he, he was gone. So I, I have been told by people so that it is possible for a, a heron to swallow a fish of that size. I find it hard to believe but who knows. Now. In addition to salmon, there's many other species of fish, smaller fish, and there's one particular kind of fish that I had no idea existed in the in the river when I moved to Coquitlam. So it was quite a thrill to to discover these creatures. This is a, a juvenile uh, lamprey. It's about four inches long, and this is in a small pool uh, close to my beach, um, sandy bottom. The pool is about two two inches deep. And this is one that Shelley will recognize. This is a uh, Maple Creek does fish trapping along the creek to uh, monitor the uh, salmon populations. And so this fellow was caught in a fish a salmon trap, a G trap, minnow trap uh, at Davies. And uh, so he's about um, well, about 13, 14 centimeters long. So he's a juvenile. And they're they're fascinating, fascinating creatures. I mean, look look at the uh, the mouth on this guy. So this is an adult, which uh, I found near me. He's 22 uh, centimeters. They grow, I'm told they grow to about 30 centimeters. Um, I took this one up to SFU to have it identified and it was identified as a river lamprey. Um, there's a, at least two species that live in the, uh, in the river, uh, river being one of them, Western Brook, I think is the other. Um, but, you know, when I think of lampreys, I have this picture in my mind of the lampreys in, uh, the Great Lakes, where you saw these pictures of hundreds of lampreys hanging off of these fish and just parasitizing the heck out of them. 
but uh, these guys are actually, they're part of the system. They're an important part of the system here. Um, yeah, they're, if you have lampreys, I'm told that you have, it means you have a healthy stream. The, the mouth on these guys is absolutely horrifying. Uh, Ew. Mm. Ew. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, that, was, that was my reaction too. <laughs> so, so now we will hop to uh, another side Jeff, Jeff, just before yeah. you go on, um, there was a comment about the sculpins, the one that you um, <coughs> found on um, Not in the Water. Yeah. Uh, sculpins are, this is from John Saremba and okay. also uh, Jim and Judy um, talked about it as well. But sculpins are one of the fish species that can br even breathe surface air up to 24 hours through their skin. Ah, well, that would explain wow. it. Wow! Yeah, isn't that um, during low tides, they burrow, they burrow under kelp and seaweed, and um, even if uh, exposed to air. Wow, that's 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 wonderful. Isn't that intriguing? So through the skin. Hmm. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll now take a, a really sharp um, change in topic. Um, this Slime molds. Slime molds. Yeah, I find slime molds absolutely fascinating. Uh, they're, they're strange. So they're not an animal, they're not a vegetable, they're not a fungus. Uh, so they're classified in this kingdom Protista. There are, there are now five kingdoms. There used to be two when I was a kid. Um, and they're basically stuck in there because they don't fit in with any of the other kingdoms. I gather Protista is just where you put everything that, that doesn't fit. Um, there's about 116 species wow. in BC. And there's three varieties that are, are easy to see along the river. Um, the first one is called, the popular name is dog's vomit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's also called scrambled eggs, which is a little more, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I call it dog's vomit, which is what most people call it. You can get an idea for the, the scale of this. Uh, the, the log that this uh, one is on is about 18 inches in diameter. So that's, uh, you know, that gives you a feeling for the scale of these guys. That's a large one. They usually grow on logs or dead leaves or moss. This one's uh, just a couple of inches across on, on moss. Um, occasionally, this is the only time I've ever seen this on uh, the stem of a plant, um, leaves. And the... Uh, <laughs> I'll go back to that one. Uh, <laughs> um, they have a very interesting life cycle. So most of the time, they, they're in a thing called a plasmodium, where they're almost invisible. They move around uh, under, under bark, under leaves. And then when it's time to reproduce, they coalesce into, into this uh, fruiting body. And uh, so just to, uh, hold on. Oh, there we go. Um, so to give you an idea of how rapidly these things change, um, this is a chunk that was about down by my beach. Um, so I, I went down on a regular basis and took photos. So this is at 8.30 on, in the evening. And so I'll zoom in on that. So that's what it looked like at 8.30. And then 12 hours later, it looked like this. Now, if you focus on this uh, leaf stem here, you can get some feeling for uh, the layout of this. So I'll, I'll show you. So that's at, eight, at 9 o'clock on June 3rd. And this is five hours later, five and a half, six hours later. Oh. So uh, I'll, I'll toggle between the two just to give you a feeling for, for how, it, how it evolved. So you can see that there's over here, there's some clumps in here, and then there's all these little fine um, threads, if we, if we can call them that. And then six hours later, time. basically it's all coalesced here. And there's still some threads here and some little bits of stuff here. And so if we fast forward, then a few hours later we have it's basically all one clump. And at that point, it stops moving around and it starts forming spores. So this is a little bit later. And then the uh, fruiting body sort of decays there and there. And then this is three and a half days after the, the first photo. And it's basically just, just nothing. <laughs> so the, the, the second one that you often see is, is something called wolf's milk. Uh, I don't I have no idea why it's called loose milk, loose milk but <laughs> they're these beautiful little spheres. Uh, they're sort of 
up to about say three eighths of an inch in diameter. They're usually pink, but sometimes they're orange, uh, sometimes brown, and they change color fairly quickly. And uh, there they are there. They look spongy. Are they soft? Uh, they're sort of puffball kind of consistency when they're, they first start. So, you, you know, you can squeeze them a little bit. Uh, and, and they evolve again and quickly. This one has already evolved. It sort of got a little bit of a purplish tinge. A day later, it looks like that. And three days later, you can see that it's starting, it's, it's gone hard and the, um, the skin is sort of starting to, to flake off there. And then the third variety is uh, called Stemonitis. There's a bunch, several species of Stemonitis. Um, I have no idea what species these are. Um, this particular one starts off as these white spheres. And then 12 hours later, you have these guys. Oh my. And, um, you know, they, they look completely different. So these are, uh, these are about half an inch high, these little uh, sort of, tubules of stock. And um, so, you know, those white spheres become these brown tubules. There are several different colors. These ones are, are purple on black stocks. And then these ones are black. Oh. They look like jellyfish. Yes, they do, don't they? <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe Pac-Man ghosts or something. There you go. <laughs> Exactly. So, so now these ones are yellow. So, so this was on the Crystal Falls Trail, and I, so I was walking up and I saw these guys. So I took some photos. Some of them were still at the sort of the sphere stage. Some of them had started to grow little um, stalks, but they were hadn't progressed very far. And then an hour and a half later, on my way back, the, they're well-defined tubules. So they had gone from from basically that to that in an hour and a half. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so bugs, how, how are we doing? Uh, are, are you, uh, is everybody doing okay? Or, uh, yeah. We're yeah. doing great, Jeff. Oh, yeah, this is great. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. So just a, just a few shots of bugs. Um, I've only ever seen this once. So uh, I, was up, I was walking down the river one night and I saw this incredibly bright, small green light on the ground. I have no idea what it was. And I, my first thought was that it was somebody's keychain with a green LED on it that they dropped. Nice. But uh, so I dropped down and, and checked it out. And it turned out it was a little bug. So I brought it home. And this yeah. is it here. Wow. And this is actually, it turns out, uh, it was identified by a fellow at SFU. Um, this is a firefly larva. And for some reason or other, the larva bioluminescence, the adult doesn't bioluminesce, but the, the, the larvae do. And I have no idea why, what sort of, you know, evolutionary advantage there is to bioluminescing as a, as a larva. I would have thought it would draw attention to you when you get eaten, but uh, anyhow, uh, it's the only time I've ever seen that. Wow. There's a bumblebee. This is in honor of uh, Sid Canning two weeks ago. So everybody can identify that and uh, <laughs> and an email to Sid saying that you've seen a, a bumblebee. And uh, dragonfly, so dragonfly. I was watching dragonfly. I don't know what species it is. I'm told it might be an Aishnid or something, but uh, um, again, another uh, exercise for the reader there Not to me. go home and look it up. Yeah. Um, this guy was actually stuck, was uh, floating on a, on a pool beside the river and it couldn't escape because the, uh, the um, surface tension on the wings was too great. So I got a little piece of wood and uh, slipped it under the bug and brought it out and put it on this log and it walked around for a while shaking the wings drying off and uh, again they're just lovely lovely creatures they're really quite remarkable and uh, now again you know it's interesting to go back and look at your photos because when I took this photo I didn't think much of it but then when I was looking at it noticed that over here there's all this loose sand uh, and so the beetle is clearly, he's doing something. I don't know uh, whether it's laying an egg or uh, climbing out of a hole. Uh, there's another bug hole over here. But uh, anyhow, another exercise for the reader there. If anybody's got a, a suggestion as to what he's doing, uh, let me know. 
Now, th this is an example of the power of Google. So when I saw these guys, I went home and I Googled tiny yellow spiders. Oh. And Google. Oh, look at the, yeah, oh my. <laughs> Ew. Yeah. So anyhow, it's called Arrhenius uh, diadematis. Google tiny yellow spiders and they'll, they'll come up with hundreds of pictures of these guys. And this guy is a crab spider. So thanks to Victoria, we know he's a, <clears throat> a Misumina viata. Apparently they're called crab spiders because they move sideways. Um, and this I think is a female, but they're, they're sort of nasty creatures because they, uh, they, uh, they kill and eat bees. Oh, look at that. Mm. <laughs> well, this is the, the, the next category is sort of a grab bag. Uh, I was trying to find some way to link these together. And so I thought, well, you know, we're used to seeing water is in the river, in the mist over the river. We're used to seeing rain. But water <laughs> in different, uh, different forms. So often on a damp day you'll see a spider web that's got water drops on it and uh it's just just an absolutely lovely pattern of, uh, of droplets on the uh, on the on the spider web spider webs are really interesting things they if you examine them closely they actually have little uh, sort of spheres along them where the um spider uh, exudes the silk you often get uh, water drops on leaves Oh, and uh, on the tips of branches of horsetails, which, uh, you know, when the sun is shining on these things, they're just absolutely spectacular. You can actually get a, a refraction through some of the drops, and so the, the drops will be like little tiny prisms. And when the rain is heavy, uh, the rain will hit the trees and they'll flow down the bark and drip off little expressions of the bark and form this foam here. So what's happening is the, the water is uh, trickling down the bark and leaching some chemical out, which uh, <coughs> is of some kind, which causes it to form bubbles. Um, I've seen this on hemlocks mainly, but cedars and cottonwoods. Uh, and it can be quite extensive. These, uh, these sort of strips of foam can be uh, six or eight inches long. Uh, there's a lot of ground, uh, sorry, there's a lot of iron in the groundwater uh, along the Coquitlam River. And what happens is that there are, uh, you can form iron films on pools by, beside the river. Uh, they look like oil slicks, but they're not. They're, they're perfectly natural. They're, they're an iron film. And uh, they're actually quite, if, if you poke one, if you poke an oil slick, the slick will coalesce immediately. If you poke one of these, it will fragment and it won't coalesce instantly. So you'll get a uh, little sort of polygons of, uh, of bits of film. The, the interesting thing about this, now I'm not sure how well this will show up, but if you look, if I'll, I'll move the mouse along. If you look along here, you can see these tracks on the surface of the film. They're, they're made visible by so the only thing I could come up with was that it was a, a water strider. But again, I, I don't really know. It's the only time I've ever seen that. And in the winter time, you get some wonderful, wonderful forms of ice on branches and twigs beside the river. They're just, uh, again, they're just, just things of beauty. And then th this one, I, I so these were <laughs> Icicles on a log over the river, and they formed these bells at the bottom. Oh, wow. That is so cool. And then on the surface of ponds, you get these wonderful, wonderful crystallization patterns. That happened to Blakeford. And then this is this is hair ice, which forms in cold, dry weather on uh, rotting logs. There's a chemical in the logs which allows the ice to extrude in these very fine filaments. Hmm. And you see this everywhere at this time of year, and it's the the patterns are just lovely. Yeah, you know, we could, I could have put up about a hundred photos of this, <laughs> but it would have been about too much. Pretty, isn't it? So now, uh, this is the final final segment of the, the show. Um, 
we'll start off. I was doing a letter pickup one day and went over to pick up this piece of plastic. And there beside it was this little guy here. That is a dipper. American dipper. And it didn't fly away, unfortunately, when I approached. So I suspected something was wrong. So I watched it for about 20 minutes and it, it walked around. It didn't show any signs of distress, but it, it wasn't flying. So I went home and got a box and a towel and picked it up and uh, just incredibly light. I put it in the box and took it to wildlife rescue, but unfortunately they weren't, weren't able to, uh, to heal it and it, it died. Uh, I didn't find out what the cause of death was, but it was some internal in injury. But they, they told me that it, this dipper weighs 40 grams. And so a toonie weighs about seven grams. So this, if you, if you put six toonies in your hand, you'd have the weight of this dipper. Uh, just, just remarkable creatures. And there he is there. Just absolutely, just a beautiful, this is my favorite bird actually. I, I, I can watch these birds for hours. Is that the young one? I, it looks young. Um, do we have a dipper expert in that? Uh, you know, you can tell a little bit by the scalloping on the wings, but uh, you can't really see that here. Um, no, we can't tell. My guess is it's a young one, but I don't, I can't, I can't say for sure. So to end on a, on a, a more upbeat note, um, this is a hummingbird nest. Mm, wow. And uh, so I was able to follow this from the construction through to uh, when the youngsters fledged. Oh, my. And uh, so I'll just show some shots of the, uh, the youngsters. Uh, there they are. They're getting close to fledging. I think they fledged about two or three days after these shots were taken. <clears throat> so there's, there's the mother. Oh, my word. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click through these fairly quickly. So it'll be like doing a flip strip book of, uh, of the, um, the hummingbird. So the, the mother flies in and she feeds the youngsters. Let me know if this is too fast or too slow. That's good, Jeff. My goodness. And then she's away. And she can be away for five minutes. She can be away for 20 minutes or half an hour. And then the little guys are sort of moving around in the nest. Wow. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so and then she comes back and feeds them again. So these shots were all taken uh, at the same time, uh, you know, over a space of about an hour and a half or two. So, and then if, away she goes. Is that in Anna's? I, I uh, here, I'll stop it when the, the female comes. I, I think it's a, a Rufus, but I, I, I you know, I, I bow to a, a bird expert. Can, can you, anybody tell from that shot? I would say Rufus because of the buffy sides. Okay, great. Wow, that's, mm -hmm. that is amazing. Oh, here she is. She's actually feeding them from the air. Wow. <laughs> These are great shots, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Just Thanks for great. spending all that time there. We get the benefit of your patience. Wow. That's amazing. Amazing. And, <laughs> and here he, here's the little guy trying out his wings. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, I took two million shots here, so you're, you're only seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> and there they are. Look and so that's the end. Wow. That's wonderful. Wow. Thank you so great. much, Jeff. Great. 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 Fantastic. Wonderful. That was awesome. Thank you. So I think, I, think Jeff, I think Jeff would like to open up to, to questions. Um, there were a, a couple of uh, comments and questions that uh, came in through the chat. Um, back on to video. And uh, there was well some comments on in that um, from from uh, Jim and Judy that uh, Jeff this is this is really fun and interesting you are a natural interpreter who knew <laughs> and, um, and from Kathy I love how you rescued the dragonfly great photographs uh, Jeff I did have a question for you you should also mention uh, another important species that you've found over the years that we had the pleasure several times of observing in the Coquitlam River, and that's bats foraging along the river itself. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, just we don't have any photos that. of bats, so uh, <laughs> no. I, I could show a, a black screen. And, uh... 
No kangaroos yeah, yeah, with thumbs? Yeah. <laughs> no, we had the pleasure of going out with Jeff and he showed me several sections and it was fascinating to watch uh, little brown bats and uh, Yuma myotis bats, which are well known for foraging along calm sections of the river. And we sat near his home uh, on a beach, just watching the bats and uh, how they would circle around the slower moving water, picking up aquatic insects. And they also use the trail area for commuting from foraging site to foraging site. So it's, it's quite interesting to see that even something as big as the Coquitlam River and as fast moving as it is, there are sections that provide very useful foraging habitat for at least several different species of bats. Jeff, back in the uh, late 80s, I was a steelhead salmon fisherman and then I spent many, many hours on the Coquitlam. And they have actually a fairly good run of steelhead in the river. And another bird that you didn't mention was uh, often I would see uh, common mergansers on the river. Surfing. Yeah. Raising their young. Yeah, common mergansers, hooded mergansers, wood ducks. Um, we Plus the, 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 the Chinook salmon, that was one that when I fished there, there, there weren't any, and, and there actually wasn't any run of pinks at that time either. So those must have well, been- the pinks uh, have you know, the pinks have really um, come back very, very well. Um, they, you know, they uh, most of you already know this, but back in the 50s, the river was uh, dragged for gravel, which basically made the pinks extinct in the river. And uh, uh, largely through the efforts of the Poco and District Hunting and Fishing Club. Uh, yeah, talking to some of the locals that lived along the river way, way yeah. back in the dark ages in the 80s, yeah. they said that there was used to be huge runs of, 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 of those salmon up, up the river. Oh yeah, uh, it, it's just horrifying what what the uh, what has been done to the river, but it is coming back, which is a, a positive positive thing. On Sunday, we spotted a dipper at Sassanat Lake. Good. Oh, isn't that great? Actually, in the lake or? Uh, uh just on a log on the edge. Okay. Yeah, we just we we're going around the lake with Christina. Yeah. Was was it near a stream that was coming into the lake? Uh, just some of the runoff that's on the east side of the lake. Coming off the rocks, it's yeah. not an as it's not really um an, an established creek. Yeah. It's like runoff coming off rocks. I find it amazing that uh, people walk by stuff and they don't see it. Uh, speaking of hummingbirds, there was a hummingbird not far off between Shaughnessy and the dog park, uh, uh, the Shaughnessy Dog Park and Lloyd Highway, about 20 feet off the ground above the trail, uh, a, a paved section. And wow. people were walking by and they didn't even see this thing, right? And it was amazing. Hmm. I had a question, Jeff, how did you spot the hummingbird nest? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's basically a fluke. Uh, so I, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to see about 10 hummingbird nests in, in, in my life. I don't know if that's considered a lot or a few, uh, but most of them have been uh, by pure fluke. So uh, for example, typically one, I saw a hummingbird chasing a chickadee and I, and I thought, gee, you know, that's kind of strange. So I watched the hummingbird and it flew to a nest and, and that, that was how I, how I found that one. The one that I showed you is actually quite obvious. Um, and I saw the hummingbird fly to it. And once, once I saw it, that was it. So th there's a lot of chance involved in this. Uh, that nest, however, has been used at least two years in a row and possibly three. I'll have to check my notes. They, they rebuilt it uh, each year. So using the old nest as a foundation, they, they sort of raised it up a little bit with some fresh uh, lichen and spider webs and things. But it is a real thrill to see a hummingbird nest. I know, Susan, uh, you found one down in, near your place a couple of years ago. Yes, well, I was shown it. I didn't find it by myself. But oh, it was just absolutely fascinating to watch. It was um, an Anna's hummingbird nest. My goodness. Mm. I'm, I'm very lucky to also live on the river, but I'm on the opposite side of yeah. So I, I walk it every day and it's ever fascinating. It's always new stuff. The river changes, there's different birds and the 
the plant life is amazing. And, and quite a few uh, mammals too, otters, beavers, bears, of course. Um, mm. What's the other little, little one? Uh, uh, mink. Rats. Right. You, you see a fair number of mink and um, coyotes, deer, bears. I, I've actually seen a short tailed weasel once, <laughs> just once. <laughs> and at salmon spawning time, there's, well, there, after the salmon spawn, after they've died, there are so many different birds that eat the salmon and the eggs. So this year, for the first time, I saw mallard ducks eating dead salmon. Wow. The dippers eat the eggs. Um, I've seen heron eating them. The otter eats them. Um, the eagles, of course. And then there's a lot of gulls around at that time, too. So you really see how the, the dead salmon are incorporated into the other animals. So uh, as I said, I, I've got uh, at least five hours worth of material. So maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe next year we'll, we'll there, do another one. <laughs> there, there, was, there was a couple of other questions here. Um, if, if anybody knows, Jeff was talking about the, the foam that was on the, the hemlock tree. Um, and so, and Neil was asking about the, the chemicals about, um, does anybody have any idea how, how that foam is formed? And I was also wondering if that foam is the same kind of foam that you see in the creeks. I don't know if anybody has an answer for that. Good question. Okay. And I'm not sure about this, about uh, being um, from Sherry. Does anyone know if the ban on bird feeders applies to all kinds of feeders, seed feeders, suet feeders, and hummingbird feeders? I'm not sure what the ban is. So um, There's a recent ban on, they're telling people not to put their seed feeders out because of uh, risk of salmonella. Okay. That they're finding a lot of dead birds. And uh, they analyze. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. Particular pine siskins. Yes. Particularly that one breed. Yeah. It's pine siskins. And don't, if you have a lower tray, take those feeders in. If you've got a hanging suet, it, they, they probably, it's not a problem, I don't it's think. It's probably okay. But if you have a tray, definitely just bring it right in. All, all our feeders have been in no. for months. Yeah. As soon as what about the uh, hummingbird feeders, in. like the nectar feeders? Are they okay too? Oh, I think they're okay. Yeah. yeah. Really, not that I've noticed. I have seen siskins use my suet feeder, so I wipe it down with a bleach solution when I change the suet. Oh, okay. thanks, Jillian. Good, yeah. good, good advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Ruth commented that the um, the dipper, um, that it was a, a juvenile dipper uh, because it had a yellowish beak. The adult's beak is darker. Just about the sculpins, Jeff. Yeah. Um, Mark and Christina and I did a walk at Colony Farm at the old field, looking at the area where the Trans Mountain would be setting up. And uh, we came across two otters and they were diving under the ice and then coming up and eating fish. And I could see the fin and it looked like it might've been a sculpin and the right size. So that's kind of interesting. Wow. Most people would think in between the industrial buildings, um, as you walk towards the river, um, before you meet up with the trail that goes back to forensic, there's a flooded path, but they were there. And you could see that they were eating fish from what most people think is a ditch. So just thought I'd mention that. Yeah, no, that's good. Excellent. John, did you take note of that? Yes, I did. Okay. And I have a, we have, Christina took a video of the otters. So I'll send it off to Victoria. We also saw a coyote in the same field. On the coldest uh, day in the snowy day, I was surprised to find a hummingbird up on my 16th floor. And I thought, oh, poor soul, you'll be hungry because you can't get anything. So anyway, anyway, he came back. So I went in, I have a little red glass. So I mixed up some sugar water, got it out, but I haven't seen him since. <laughs> so he was a thin, not much color, 
hummingbird and I felt very bad I did I didn't have anything for him but uh, so he hasn't been back so I'll bring my nice red it's warmed up now but I was totally surprised to see this hummingbird right up the 16th floor I think it may have some stained glass in the window with a bit of red in it so maybe that but it was a lovely treat, but I felt badly that I didn't have any sugar water out for him. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't think it would come up that high. <laughs> While he was there. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Apparently. Well, once before I was sitting there and I had something red and, and again in the window, maybe a candle or something. And a hummingbird was right up at that window, but, uh, mm. but I felt badly because I think this one was hungry. He was definitely looking for something. But he, he, I haven't seen him, but it's milder now, so I'm sure he's found something. Yeah. Somebody told me that in the little pits and the cement of the buildings, that there are little spiders and things that are oh, hiding yeah. because the, the tall buildings are quite warm. And mm -hmm. I have a friend on the 18th floor in her apartment, and she regularly gets hummingbirds, and they'll go up and down the concrete. So they must be getting something. So the wall, the warm wall, mm -hmm. yeah. picking up something. We lived on the eighth floor of an apartment building in West Vancouver, and the hummingbirds were frequently flying past our window <coughs> vertically, growing to feeders above us and below us. <laughs> and uh, I think that, you know, mentioning spiders, uh, all winter, the, the spider webs on the windows. Uh, the little sp spider, that's, I'm sure that the hummingbirds get their protein by uh, eating spiders from, from the apartment, on these apartments. Yeah, I think so too. My sister lives on about the 11th floor in, in Richmond. And uh, one day we're talking on the phone and they have spiders so many on the outside of their building that she, they can hardly go out at certain times of the year. Oh and she's just, she's talking to me and a hawk went right by her head practically. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, birds go up high sometimes. We see eagle mm -hmm. and herons and I've seen owls go right by. We're on the fourth floor, but mm -hmm. it's really neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see Canada geese and I see lots of gulls and I see the odd hawk and uh, crows, but uh, that hummingbird really caught my eye. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't expect it that high. No. I've had a, a great view of a um, sharp chinned hawk. I realized that I'm providing breakfast for the hawk because <laughs> I have, I have uh, feeders and the siskins are there regularly. And I suddenly realized that all the little birds had disappeared and this hawk came in. <laughs> so I felt a little badly for the little ones that they were sitting ducks with a hawk. <laughs> yes. We used to have a sharp shin who used to come in at uh, just a, below the fence level, come over the back gate and into the, onto the feeder and you always get a, uh, a junk hole. Mm. Never got a chance to do that. No, they have. They have signals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should tell you about the time I was up on my roof and I was checking the chimney for a leak and Myrna hollered out the front uh, window that there's a hawk got a chickadee in the front uh, uh, cherry thing and I sprayed the hawk <laughs> to, get it, oh. to leave the ch chickadee alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to... <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, Ruth commented on the beetle that uh, was was seen on the dead salmon. Uh, Fry was a snail killer, carabid, <laughs> uh, and they eat slugs as well. Snail kill? Hmm. 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 All right, so it, if there aren't any questions, maybe we'll bring the show and share to an, an end. So, uh, Ian, uh, oh, I have a, a short video of the hummingbirds. Okay. Which, 
uh, if, if anybody, if people are interested, I could try showing it. I don't know how well it'll it'll show, but this would be a, a useful experiment if people are willing to. Uh, it's twenty seconds long, so uh, Great. sure. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Thank you, Jeff. By the way, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, oh, here, here goes. Twenty seconds now. Two birds and a. Yeah. 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 He's okay, content. well, uh, schedule a weekend and we'll. <laughs> <laughs> I love the slime molds. That was just spectacular. That was fabulous. Oh, that was fascinating. Way to go. Oh, all awesome. Except I, I was eating dinner when he showed the dog's vomit. It wasn't really oh. good. <laughs> <laughs> It is being recorded. So um, if we do end up putting it, uh, there'll be a, a, a link sent out as well so great thank you Wonderful. thanks very much yeah, thank, thank you, you. Yeah. that was great thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very good good night thank thank you. thanks for coming out have a good night thank you very much thank you. Thank you. Thank you.